Yes. I've already lost a few minutes. Okay. Uh, yes. Sir. All right. Should I start? Or you have... are, you are you expecting more participants? Yes, sir. We are expecting. Yeah, we... Can we wait a minute? Wait. wait. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. People are just coming, sir. Shall I start uh, screen sharing? Uh, by the yes, time. Okay. You can share. Okay. Is it visible? Yes, yes sir. Okay. Actually, I think I should start. Otherwise, it's going to be very tight. Uh, by the time people join, you can start. Uh, that would be a good idea, sir. OK. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, so thank you once again for inviting me. And uh, today, I'll be talking about a very specialized topic, unlike last time when I uh, gave a very overarching view of evolution of industrial policy in India. Today, we'll be on only one particular policy, which has come into prominence only very recently, in the last 10 to 12 years. Now, originally, I was going to talk only about anti-cartel enforcement. That is what is on the program. But then I realized that many people are not very familiar with the whole idea of competition policy of which anti-cartel enforcement is one component. So I thought it is a good idea to begin with a general introduction to competition policy and competition law, and then come to the specialized area of anti-cartel enforcement. So this is really two presentations back to back, packed into one. So that's why I thought I should start. Even if some people join late, that's okay, because um, I want today's session to be a little more interactive. And so I posed some questions for the audience. But first, let me give a general definition of antitrust law, which is also called competition law. Antitrust is the term used in the United States. Competition law is used in most other countries, including India and the European Union. There is a third terminology, anti-monopoly law, which is used in China and parts of East Asia. But the coverage of all these laws is substantially the same and is converging over time with several differences some of which I shall point out in the course of the presentation. So a general definition of antitrust or competition law or laws, because some, country, some countries have more than one competition law. So laws that prohibit or regulate business practices, mergers and acquisitions 
that present or limit competition. So that's why it's called competition law. So the first question therefore arises is why in the United States is this called antitrust? That doesn't seem like a very good name because trust is something you would like to encourage. So why should there be an antitrust law? So would any member of the audience like to venture an answer to this? Why is it called antitrust only in the United States? There's a historical reason for that. No? Hmm. That's the problem nowadays in economics, people don't study history. When I was younger, economic history was a important and respected compulsory component of studying economics. Of course, we didn't study antitrust, but we had a general sense of uh, how different countries evolved in their economies and economic policy. So it is called antitrust in the US because a trust in the US and as in India is an organizational form whereby a small number of individuals, sometimes even just one family, use a trust, a registered trust, which owns controlling stakes in many different nominally independent companies. So those companies may be nominally independent, but they have a common controlling interest in the form of the trustees of the controlling trust. So in India, we know very well the house of Tata, all the individual Tata companies, whichever industry or sector they are functioning in, they are all indirectly owned and controlled by the Tata Trust, of which the Tata family are the major trustees. So also in the late 19th century in the United States, there were many family trusts, the most famous being the um, Rockefeller family, well-known multimillionaires uh, who use their trust to own and control the activities of many different industries like steel, uh, oil, railroads, etc., and coordinated their activities. And in the late 19th century, there was a, a popular revolt against this control by the trusts, and therefore the laws that came to be passed in the US are called antitrust laws. So this trust has nothing to do with the virtue of being trustworthy. It, in a way it does because the trustees are entrusted with uh, conducting the business of their trust. But at that time, it was regarded with a lot of popular uh, opposition. So that takes me to the second question. What was the modern world's first antitrust law? Can anyone identify it? If you don't want to speak up for any reason, you can put it privately in the chat box and I won't identify it in case it's the wrong answer. I, I, won't, I, I won't identify the person who gave it, because, but I would like to have some interaction in this session. Last time I packed in too much and I didn't get to hear from the members of the audience at all, except in the last few minutes. So any, any guesses? Well, when I asked this in other seminars, I, I have to say that even students often give an answer. It's not the correct answer, but it's the most popular answer. That is something called the Sherman Antitrust Act of the United States, which was passed in 1890. 
called the Sherman Act because it was proposed by a Senator Sherman. In the US, a lot of laws are named after the senators who sponsor them, right? So that was passed in 1890, but it was not the modern world's first antitrust law. Actually, the first was a, passed a year earlier in Canada called the Combines Investigation Act of 1889. But it was not seriously enforced for many years. So the Sherman Act, uh, which was enforced very seriously uh, right from the start, can be regarded as the modern world's first really operational antitrust law. Now, another catch to this question. I've said the modern world's first antitrust law, but actually it might interest you to know that India actually has the distinction of having one of the earliest, if not the earliest, prescriptions, which would today be called antitrust. That is, in Kautilya's Arthashastra, there is a section talking about penalties to be imposed on merchants who form a cartel. So that was over 2000 years ago. The exact date of the Arthashastra is not well identified, but it was possibly in the third century before the common era. And, uh, but that was not a law, it was just Kautilya's prescription. The whole Arthashastra is his prescriptions for an ideal uh, polity and legal system. Okay, now I hope someone can answer the third question, the third pair of questions. What is the name of India's competition law? Current competition law. I actually mentioned it in my first session last time. Competition Act 2002. Ah, right. Absolutely right. 2002 competition law. Uh, what was the earlier law? Any idea? Most of you are old enough to have. <laughs> Monopolies and restrictive uh, practices. MRTP Act. Right. Anyone know the full form? Monopoly Restrict Restrictive Trade Practices Act. Yes. And then when was that passed? Hmm. 1969. At the height of the so called socialist tilt of the government, same year as bank nationalization, other nationalizations, uh, and so on, the year before the Patents Act. So it was part of that era. Right, coming back to the competition law, what agency enforces the competition law? Competition Commission of India. That's right. Competition Commission of India or CCI. Well, I'm glad I decided to give a general background to competition law because um, really these are things which at least economics teachers should be familiar with, but it looks like most of you were not familiar or you were reluctant to show your guess, uh, even get, give guesses. Anyway, so therefore, all the more reason for me to give more of a background on what competition law deals with. Remember from the general definition, it was it is a law to prohibit or regulate anti-competitive practices. What are these anti-competitive practices? They fall into two categories. The first is restrictive agreements among firms. That is agreements that restrict competition. These can be subdivided into horizontal and vertical agreements. Horizontal and vertical in the context of competition law or industrial economics generally means, horizontal means between 
firms at the same stage of production, that is firms that compete with each other. And vertical means firms at successive or different stages of production in what is called a supply chain relationship. That is, they provide uh, inputs to each other or they are retailers or distributors who distribute the products of other firms. So that's a, those are successive stages in the supply chain. Now there can be different kinds of agreements between firms which are placed either horizontally or vertically in relation to each other. The classic horizontal relationship are the cartel agreements, which will be the focus of the second half of today's presentation. Cartels are agreements or organizations that agree in which different firms agree either to fix their prices, obviously at a level higher than the level that would arise if they competed with each other. That is the competitive or Nash equilibrium price. They would prefer a price that is higher than that. Or which comes to the same thing. You can either, the cartel members can either fix a minimum price or restrict the quantities so as to bring about a higher price. That is, they all agree not to produce more than uh, agreed amount each. The third is possibility of allocating territories between themselves. That is, each one is given an exclusive territory and the others agree not to compete in those territories. So one firm may be given an exclusive territory in the northern region of a country, another in the southern, or maybe depending on how large the country is, they may be allotted different states. And there have been instances where firms form international cartels where they agree that different countries will be carved up in, and allocated amongst themselves. So for example, American firms are assured by European firms that uh, European firms will not supply the American market and reciprocally, American firms agree not to supply the European market. And there have been instances where Japanese firms have also taken part in such agreements and been allocated exclusive territories in to serve Japan and neighboring countries on condition that they do not try to supply American and European consumers. So that restricts competition. And another kind, which is very common in many countries, but especially in countries with large government sector with government procurement is rigging of bids. That is whenever there's a government tender for procuring any supplies, whether it is stationary or computers or construction contracts or defense purchases, the different sellers meet in advance and agree on the bid or bids they will make, who will be allowed to quote the lowest price or whether they should all quote the same price so the contract is shared amongst them. And there have been many, many such cases which have been dealt with by the Competition Commission of India also. Then coming to vertical restraints, that is agreements between firms at different stages of the supply chain, typically between manufacturers and distributors. Um, this is a bit specialized, so I will just mention them. It'll take too long to explain. And I think now I'm getting worried about timing. So uh, these are just some terms that are used. The other category of anti-competitive practices concerns abuse of dominance by a single firm. The first category concerns agreements between firms to restrict competition. Second category, abuse of dominance by a single firm. And the important thing to note is that in the Competition Act and in the competition laws of most countries, large size by itself is not illegal. 
unlike in the MRTP Act, whose purpose was to restrict the size and growth of firms, it did not really work because we know that was the period when Tata's and Birla's uh, grew uh, at a rapid rate. But it was one of the criticisms, which is why the MRTP Act was first diluted and then repealed and replaced by the Competition Act, which looks not at how large a firm is. It does not discourage growth of a firm. It discourages certain kinds of behavior, which are called abuse of dominance. These would include predatory pricing. That is if a large firm charges a price below what it would normally, maybe even below its own cost, that is deliberately make losses with the idea of discouraging or driving out compet competitors. Uh, this is an allegation which has currently been made against um, say Amazon. The very low prices we get because of substantial discounts from Amazon have allegedly destroyed the business of indiv individual uh, small retail outlets and they have filed a case against Amazon on this, these grounds as well as others. That case is yet to be resolved. The other instance of abuse of dominance is what is called tying. That is making the sale of one product conditional on buying another product of the same producer. So a producer who has a dominant position in one product can try to push his other product which faces more competition by tying it. And the classic example of this was allegations against Microsoft many years ago that because they had a dominant almost monopoly position in the Microsoft uh, operate, uh, Windows operating system, they pushed their own other softwares, that is the, the internet browser, for example, that is the internet explorer, their media player, and other softwares by insisting that any computer manufacturer who wants to sell his computers with the Windows operating system must also include other Microsoft softwares, which had other competitors, some of which were better. Users regarded them as better, but they knew that if they, there was no alternative to the operating, the uh, Windows operating system, therefore they went in for all the entire range of Microsoft softwares, including Microsoft Office, which we all use for word processing, spreadsheeting, and so on. Okay, and the other, the final aspect of uh, coverage of uh, competition law, which I will not be talking about today, is mergers and acquisitions, both horizontal and vertical. To the extent that they restrict competition, the competition law and the competition agency can either prohibit them or approve them with some uh, conditions. Now I'm going to be concentrating on cartels. So I'll spend a little more time on cartels. Out of all the practices listed on the previous slide, cartels seldom have any beneficial effects. That is, they are like monopoly. The, the firms get together and instead of having competitive pricing or non-cooperative pricing, they establish a higher price, possibly even the monopoly price. And therefore, they, this, since we teach our students in first year BA, monopoly carries a dead weight welfare loss. So also cartels, because they try to replicate the monopoly outcome, also have, inflict a welfare loss. So in all competition laws, or most competition laws, they are treated as illegal per se. That is, as long as 
There is evidence that the firms attempted to form a cartel that is held to be illegal. And there is no need to look into positive versus negative effects. We will contrast that in the next slide with the other anti-competitive practices, which may have some positive effects. Cartels are believed to have only negative effects on welfare. And it results in heavy fines on the companies, which is usually in the form of a multiple of the excess profits that they earned during the duration of the cartel to ensure deterrence. And in some countries, they are also treated as a criminal offense. The senior executives can be sent to jail and pay heavy individual fines from their pocket, not just the fines paid by the company out of its uh, revenues, but the individual executives also have to pay fines out of pocket. And in countries like the United States, now Britain also, and Canada, and now Australia, it's a criminal offense. They can be sent to jail, and many of them have been sent to jail. In India, things are a little different under the Competition Act. Cartels are only presumptively illegal. That is, that's a legal term. It means the burden of proof to show that there was no adverse effect on competition falls on the firms. It does not have to be proved by the Competition Commission. The fines can be imposed up to three times the profits or 10% of turnover during the cartel period. But in India, it is a civil offense, not a criminal offense. So only fines can be imposed on the exec executives at the rate of up to 10% of their average incomes for the last three years. All right. So that's the general background to cartels. Very quickly, I want to contrast this with the practice or the underlying economics for the other practices listed on the first slide. All the other practices can potentially have some beneficial effects which offset the anti-competitive effect. Tying, for example, may be necessary for safety or quality. For example, a car manufacturer can say, if you buy this model of my car, you have to accept the music system or air conditioner, which I have chosen to install it. You can't buy it without it and install your own because that may cause a safety hazard, which, uh, for example, ruin the ele uh, electronics of the car, it may even cause a fire. Uh, so that might be necessary or that I have certified that th these components are of good quality. If you fit your own, if you buy your own, if, which may be cheaper, uh, I can't guarantee the quality. And since I have given you a warranty for at least the first two years, I, I will not uh, abide by the terms of that warranty. If you come in with a complaint and, and I find that you have fitted uh, unauthorized spare parts. So that's a tying kind of uh, requirement. Horizontal mergers can have certain beneficial effects. That is, even if the firms, number of firms gets reduced, larger firms can reap the benefits of economies of scale, what are called synergies. That is drawing upon the advantages of the two component firms and elimination of many duplicated costs. For example, you only need one chief executive officer, one chief financial officer, maybe one marketing manager instead of two. And there can be some rationalization at other levels of the management also. Uh, excuse me. Um, then vertical mergers, that is mergers between firms at different stages of the supply chain can eliminate transaction costs. A transaction cost is an important common component of industrial economics, basically means the costs that parties make in arriving at and enforcing a transaction. That is, especially with asymmetric information, if you're dealing with a supplier, you don't, you can't control the supplier's production process or quality. 
or delivery schedule. Therefore, if you vertically integrate or merge with a supplying firm for some inputs, then it's all under your control. So that eliminates the transaction cost. And it also eliminates what's called double marginalization. Double marginalization simply means at each stage of production, the firms are charging their profit margin. So if there are multiple stages of production or even two, there will be multiple markups, which will raise the price more price to the consumer more than it would otherwise and reduce the output even further below the optimal level. Then uh, since I didn't uh, discuss vertical restrictions in any detail, I won't discuss the various efficiency benefits of vertical restrictions, but it's an important topic in modern industrial organization and antitrust. I have uh, suggested reading at the end for those who want to uh, look into these issues in a little more detail. So uh, let me just skip this. And in fact, I, yeah, I think I'll have to uh, just skip two slides. Maybe I'll come back if there's time towards the end. What I want to do is clarify the distinction between competition policy and competition law. Competition law is a subset of competition policy, but there are many, many other policies under competition policy that are different from competition law and not within the scope of competition law. Competition policy includes all other government policies that may affect competition. And here is a list. These are all familiar to you. You can just look through it and see for yourselves which, uh, how each of these policies restricts competition. Trade policy restricts competition from imports, industrial licensing policy, which has been abolished in India virtually in the 1990s, restricts competition in two ways by uh, restricting the growth of more efficient firms that are already there and also preventing the entry of potentially more uh, efficient firms who may be denied a license. Policy towards FDI restricts the growth of, restricts competition from foreign uh, direct investment. Reservation for the public sector restricts competition from the private sector. Reservation for small scale industries, which has also been abol abandoned now, restricts competition by larger and possibly more efficient firms. Public procurement policy has some restrictions. That is, there's preference for um, purchases from small scale units. Uh, the, the most controversial subject today, of course, is public procurement of food grains at a price MSP far below, far above the competitive level. So that is also a restriction on competition. Maybe justified from each of these may have its own justification, but from the perspective of competition policy, they do restrict competition. IPR policy restricts competition simply by assigning in intellectual property rights like patents to the innovators and prevents others from utilizing that product, uh, that process or producing or selling that product without a license from the patent holder. So as I said, these policies are sovereign decisions of the government and they cannot be, although they, even if they restrict competition, they cannot be challenged under competition law, but the competition commission is given advocacy powers. That is, it can advise the government that you should think about the 
anti-competitive effects of some of some policy or the other. And the CCI has done so very quietly and sparingly on much smaller policy issues. These are very big issues. I don't think CCI would dare to challenge the government on the procure, uh, procurement policy. But and anyway, the government itself has uh, significantly liberalized the first three and is going for a much greater privatization of the public sector. So it does not need to be advised by the CCI. But there are some smaller, less well-known policies where the CCI does recommend a rethink by the government. Okay, so I'm almost at the halfway mark. So it's high time to get to the second part, which was supposed to be the main uh, topic for today. But uh, I think here, let me just pause to uh, uh, see if there are any clarificatory questions on the overall scope of competition law, especially in India. Then we'll come to the specifics of anti-cartel enforcement. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. So everything is crystal clear or people are not interested. That is the, I suppose, advantage or disadvantage of having a purely online class or refresher course. The audience can quietly go to sleep or even leave their uh, mics on and go away and do something else. Just like my students and your students, I'm sure, very often when they're taking online classes, you don't really know if they are there. And if they are there, how they are responding. Anyway, that is something we have all had to get used to. So the second part is really based on some joint work with uh, Dr. Andrila De at the Institute of Economic Growth, which was presented in a workshop of the International Economic Association organized by Professor Kaushik Basu last month, and it will come out in a conference volume uh, sometime later this year, maybe. It is also being uh, discussed with members of a joint study group set up by the Competition Commission itself. And uh, we're getting some uh, good feedback from the other academics who are part of that working group, although they are working on different topics. So that's, as I've said, this is still work in progress. So please don't quote this un, uh, until it is published. Now this will involve little more technical economics, not very much. The topic of cartels, like all of the other uh, anti-competitive practices and the policies to combat them are the subject of the broad area of economics called in modern industrial organization theory, which can get extremely technical. It involves uh, game theory in a very, very crucial way. But I'm not going to get into that because I'm not sure uh, this audience all have the background. So basically one line of algebra that I'll use here. But the basic idea of fighting cartels is derived from a general perspective on law and economics by the Nobel laureate, Professor Gary Becker. And that is that people and firms or economic agents obey laws only if the gains from doing so outweigh the gains of violating the law, net of any penalty. So it's like a cost benefit exercise, a purely economic, hard-headed, cold-blooded uh, 
calculation whether to break the law or not. It's not because of people's values or the way they were brought up or what their parents taught them or uh, what their schools taught them or what people will think of them. It's purely the monetary gains of uh, obeying the law versus the costs of, or the gains of violating the law net of any penalty. In its application to cartels, the early uh, contributions, this is all work of the 1960s and 70s or by two people called Landis and Posner separately. And this is a very easy formula. That is a firm's profit from normal competition, which I've called pi n. If, you, if we were doing this technically using game theory, the n would stand for the Nash equilibrium profit, which is the benchmark for oligopolistic firms competing non-cooperatively against each other. So that is what would happen if they obeyed the law and did not form a cartel. They would each get pi n. And they will obey the law if it that pi n exceeds its profit from participating in a cartel. So that is the cartel profit pi c for each firm minus the expected fine. Expected fine is the amount of the fine F times the probability of having to pay it, which is denoted by P. So this is the simple formula over here, All right? So to deter cartels, we must have, just turn this inequality around, we must have this being satisfied. Is you, if you want to deter cartels, you want to reverse this inequality and then you solve it for F. So then I've put it, uh, that expression again on top here. First important point to note is that since the probability of a firm of a cartel actually being detected and successfully prosecuted is always going to be less than one because Cartels are conducted in secret. The competition authorities may not get to know of it. Even if they get to know of it, they may not get the evidence to uh, successfully prove it in a court. So the probability of imposing the penalty F is going to be less than one. So if P is less than one, then the fine F must be a multiple of the gains from colluding, pi c minus pi n. For example, if the probability of finding and punishing a cartel is one third, then the fine has to be at least three times the amount that the cartel will earn from collusion, according to this formula. And this is the logic between penalties in the US or EU, which are based on a multiple of the excess profits by C minus pi N from the cartel, what is called overcharges relative to the prices they would have charged in a but for or counterfactual situation without a cartel. That is the pi N. That is if they did not have a cartel, how much profits would they make? That would be pi N the normal or Nash equilibrium profits. And then in EU and US, they have specified different so-called aggravating and mitigating factors. Aggravating factors means things like the firm that was what's called the ringleader of the cartel can be hit with a higher fine than this formula or Mitigating factor could be a firm that cooperates with the competition authorities can get a reduced fine. 
So that's the principle behind how uh, penalties are imposed. That is the, the monetary penalty on the cartelizing firms, apart from the penalty on the individual managers. So this formula also tells us that deterrence is possible with smaller fines if the probability of detection and punishment is higher. That's pretty obvious. If the probability of detection and punishment is higher, that is P is higher, then this inequality can be satisfied with a lower F. Conversely, if the probability is low, say the competition authority does not have the resources or staff to uh, successfully detect cartels, then it will need a higher penalty to deter them. Deterrence is also possible with smaller fines if there are many firms in the cartel, because then the pi C of each firm will be smaller because the maximum total profits that a cartel can make will be the profits that a monopolist could have made. So if you have many firms trying to share the monopoly profit, the share of each of them, the pi C, will be smaller and therefore once again, the fine or penalty can be lower. Then the next really requ requires some understanding of uh, basic cartel theory. The idea is that since in a cartel, each firm can benefit by cheating on the others. That is, they all agreed to charge a high price, but a firm that cheats or in game theoretic terms deviates from the cartel price can grab a larger share of the market and make a larger profit, which means there is a tendency for cartels to break down or the in, this is the, what's called the internal instability of cartels. If you are familiar with the most basic game in game theory, the prisoner's dilemma, it is similar to that. Both prisoners would be better off if they did not confess to their crime, but each one under the payoff structure of the prisoner's dilemma, each one has an incentive to confess behind the back of his partner. And since both of them have an incentive to confess, they will both confess and they will both end up with the worst outcome, that is the longest prison sentence. So also here, each firm has an incentive to cheat on the agreed on cartel price or quantity or territorial allocation. But if they all do that, if they all follow their individual rational self-interest, then the cartel will collapse. In game theory, the way this is modeled, because cartels do exist, so then why uh, does this not cause all cartels to break down? It is modeled in the form of what's called a repeated game over a long time horizon. That is the cartel members know that if they are patient enough, that is they uh, refrain from cheating on each other, then over a long enough period of time, they will make substantially more profits than any of them could get by cheating in the very first period and then causing the collapse of the cartel. It can be proved under what conditions this is an equilibrium of a repeated game. It's actually what's called the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium of a repeated game. It's basically uh, when the benefits from collusion are high enough and the discount factor is low enough. That is, firms value future profits at, uh, do not discount future profits very uh, substantially. And 
Another way in which the cartel may be discouraged is if the authorities introduce a leniency program, that is a program which encourages firms to cheat and report that they were part of a cartel. So the firm that reports it may get lenient treatment from the authorities. Sometimes even a full waiver, what is called an amnesty, it will not have to pay any fine. And the heavy fines will be imposed on those that did not report to the authorities, but got uh, convicted based on the evidence provided by the reporting firm. And then in many countries, the fine is not the only monetary disincentive. The fine goes to the government. But in many countries, begin with in the United States, but increasingly now in Europe, and it's in principle available in India also, there is provision for private follow-on claims for damages payable to the buyers who have been hurt by the cartel. That is buyers who had to pay a higher price when they bought goods or services from the cartel members after the cartel is uh, penalized by the competition authorities, private parties, whether firms or households, can claim private damages to compensate them for the losses they suffered by having to pay higher cartel prices. That they can claim directly from the cartel members. It has to be adjudicated by a court. Uh, in the US, this can lead to very, very substantial penalties. They have a principle of what's called treble damages. That is on the same principle that P is less than unity, not just the fine payable to the state, but also the private damages payable to private individuals is a multiple of the actual gains of the cartel or the loss of the cartel's victims. Okay, so that's all the theory I want to cover. Now coming to the Indian situation, the Indian, the competition law provides a specific penalty for cartels. There's a general penalty for all other kinds of offenses under the Competition Act, the kind of the abuse of dominance and the vertical agreements and so on. That is 10% of the turnover. But for cartels, there is a specific penalty, which I had on the earlier slide also. That is three times the total profit of the cartel, not three times the excess profit from cartelization, which is the international norm. So that tells us that since the total profit must always exceed the excess profit from cartelization, because firms would have made some normal profit anyway, even if they did not form the cartel, but they will have to pay a fine based on three times the total profit, including the normal profit and the cartel profit. So that is going to be more than the international norm of three times the excess profit. So in principle, the Indian competition law has a very, very stiff penalty for cartelization, higher than the international norm. And that should be adequate to deter them. It's also much easier to calculate because remember the international norm of the excess profit from calculation or the overcharge is how much is the actual profit greater than the profit that would have arisen through normal competition. So you have to 
the competition agency has to calculate and convince the court what would have been the normal profit from cartelization, the but for counterfactual situation. Why is it called but for? That is, what would have been the profits but for if it had not been for the cartel? And that is a very complicated technical exercise. There are some econometric methods available, but you need lots of data and uh, very advanced econometricians sitting in your competition authority, which we don't have. You also need very good estimates of the elasticity of demand for that product. What would have been the demand if the cartel had not raised the price? Only then can you calculate what would have been the profits. You have to calculate what would have been the average variable cost in the counterfactual situation. So it's all a very complicated exercise. In the Indian competition law, since we have only three times the total profit and not the excess profit, it is much simpler in theory. Again, a simple calculation will tell us that since in the Indian competition law, the cartels can be fined based on there's an alternative fine that is the 10% of turnover for each year that will always be greater than the 10% of the average turnover of three years, which is the penalty for all other kinds of violation of the Competition Act. Um, and this is a simple calculation that the profit based penalty will almost always be higher than the turnover based penalty. Three times the profit will always be greater than 10% of the turnover for any profit to sales ratio greater than 3.33%, which is very low. So the profit based penalty will generally be much bigger than the turnover based penalty. So very simple common sense calculations, but which tell us that India on paper has possibly the world's most uh, world's toughest anti-cartel law in terms of the penalties that can be imposed on firms that form a cartel. But there are many problems. In an earlier article, Dr. Day and I showed that the probability of getting to the point of imposing the penalties is very low because the evidence is often not good enough. From in the perspective, maybe in the, it is good enough for the competition commission, but there are two levels of appeal. Even if the competition commission finds a violation, it goes to what's called an appellate tribunal. And after that to the Supreme Court. And both those bodies have often either canceled or substantially reduced the penalties that the competition commission has imposed or found that they were wrongly imposed, that the uh, firms were wrongly found to be in violation of the act. So even for what penalties have been imposed by the competition commission, this powerful profit-based cartel penalty has been imposed in only eight. We have reviewed all the 75 cases that have been decided till date for, against cartels, which have resulted in finding of a violation. In only eight cases has the very strong cartel, uh, uh, profit-based cartel penalty been used. In most cases, it has been not, not been applied at the max possible maximum rate of three times the profit, but anything between half to double the profit. So the commission itself has been quite generous. It has not used the full uh, draconian penalizing powers which it was given under the act. 
So in only eight out of the 75 cases has the profit been pen profit based penalty been used that too at a lower rate than what is permissible. So out of the remaining 67 cases, <clears throat> most of the penalties have used the turnover base. Remember the alternative fine uh, pen formula for calculating the fine is 10% of turnover. For that, the maximum fine is 10%, but the commission in its wisdom has applied rates as low as 0.3% or 2% or 1% in some cases. And they have applied it according to the general formula of average of three years turnover rather than the cartel formula applicable to each year's turnover. Okay, so on, on that, using that formula also, the commission has been fairly lenient. Another reason why the penalties have been diluted is that many of the cases have involved what are called trade associations. That is organizations of firms, the biggest trade associations which we are familiar with are the chambers of commerce, you know, PICCI, ASOCHAM, and so on. But for, for individual sectors, there are sectoral trade associations and many cases have involved distribution of pharmaceuticals for which there are regional associations of chemists and drug wholesalers and for film distribution for which there are regional associations of film distributors. And they have banded together and imposed conditions on the supplying firms in the pharma cases, the uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing case uh, firms, in the film distribution cases, the film studios and production houses and producers. The film, dis all these associations have insisted on minimum rates of commission, uh, not allowing free distribution. They say you can distribute only through our member chemists and uh, film distributors, which of course restricts competition. Now the Competition Commission has fined many of them, but it has fined the associations based on their turnover and the turnover of an association comes only from its membership fees and advertising revenue which is a very small fraction of its members' profits. So the members may have earned cartel profits, but the penalty was imposed only on the association whose turnover had, has no necessary relationship to the cartel profits of the association members, right? And we have also identified some cases of what's called recidivism. That recidivism is a legal term, means repeat offenses. In many cases, the same association was caught engaging in the same practices again after being penalized. And even then, because the, the penalty was subject to the legal maximum of 10% of a very small base, it was obviously not a sufficient deterrent. Uh, I'll skip this issue of relevant turnover because we're running out of time. Uh, as I said earlier, several arbitrary penalties were reduced on appeal because they found flaws in the commission's procedures or its reasoning in fixing the penalties. And the net result has been that less than 1% of the total penalties imposed by the CCI have actually been recovered, that is actually been paid to the CCI. So despite a very strong law on paper, the actual deterrent effect of these penalties is probably quite weak. Okay, there's a third reason why the penalties have been diluted by the CCI itself. The CCI 
itself has refrained from imposing penalties in many cases, even when it has said these firms did have an anti-competitive agreement. Um, so we have tabulated some of the reasons given. Once again, I won't get into the details. Different, different reasons were given uh, for different cases. And uh, so out of the 75 cases in which a violation was found in 16, no penalty was imposed. In eight, only the profit-based penalty was imposed and only in the remaining, the turnover-based penalty was imposed. That is the result of our study, which we have also presented to the CCI. I don't know how they, uh, <laughs> I mean, it was only their low level officials who attended that session. So I don't know whether this was relayed to their seniors, that is the commission members who actually decide on the pe penalties, but I hope uh, there's another hearing next month where I hope some of the seniors also come and we will tell them that you're, uh, you're not being very effective. All right, I want to wind up and leave some time for discussion. So just a couple of things. I mentioned that one of the ways in which uh, the penalty can be made more effective is by introducing a leniency program that is giving a concession or reduced fine or maybe even uh, amnesty or zero fine to a firm that comes forward to the authorities with evidence which is sufficient to uh, convict its other members. In the Indian competition law, okay, I should emphasize that although I've been criticizing the, the CCI, it's had a much better record than the MRTP commission because the MRTP Act did not have any of these powers. It did not have any power to impose monetary penalty. The MRTP Commission could only pass what was called a cease and desist order. That is, okay, you've been uh, uh, forming a cartel, now you stop it. And if you do it, and if they, in some cases, the same firms were found to be doing it again, again, they, had, they could only be told to stop it. So, there was no scope for any monetary penalty. And obviously then there was no scope for any leniency because if there's no penalty, there's no scope for leniency. In, it, in the Indian Competition Act, section 46 of the act, you can see it is what's called the lesser penalties provision. It allows for lesser, lesser penalties on cartel participants who have made full, true and vital disclosure up to the time the investigation report is received by the commission provided they continue to cooperate with the commission, means continue to give evidence to help the commission to uh, successfully convict the other cartel members. And it's actually a incentive on a sliding scale that the reduction of penalty can be reduced by up to 100% for the first firm that comes forward with evidence up to 50% for the second and 30% for later applicants if they provide significant added value. It's not that just that uh, one firm comes, some other firms get to hear of it and say, no, we, we will, we're also ready to confess. They actually have to give some additional evidence, only then they will be entitled to the reduction. The CCI has decided nine, actually 10 cases so far, with 100% reduction being given in five cases. But we have also criticized the CCI for not being very consistent. Sometimes it has not given 100% to the first applicant, they've given it to the second applicant. Sometimes they give it to the first 100% to the first applicant, even though the first applicant, the CCI itself said, did not cooperate fully. And sometimes they have given 100% to all the firms in the cartel. So that really weakens the incentives for firms to come up with the evidence because 
it is important that the leniency scheme should be transparent and predictable. If you don't know how much leniency you're going to get, if any, then you cannot do that kind of cost benefit exercise to say, should I cheat or should I just stick to the cartel and take the chance that the commission may or may not be able to find evidence by itself or take the chance that some other cartel member will report to the commission. But if I'm not sure how much leniency I will get, why should I take the risk? Okay, so, and by the way, this leniency also applies to the penalties on the individual managers in some cases. All right, so as I said, the scope for damages or what's called compensation, that's section 53N of the Competition Act. This can be awarded not by the CCI itself, but by the appellate tribunal after all the appeals have been exhausted. That's why I've said, and upheld by NCLAT. NCLAT is the National Company Law Appellate Tribunal and the Supreme Court. So since all these appeals take a long, long time and enforcement of this section of the act began only in 2009. The first penalties were imposed in 2011. The appeals process is not yet complete in some most cases. And only one case so far has been awarded in principal damages, although the exact amount and formula for computing those damages has not yet been laid down. All right, and that is the end. As I said, uh, I want to leave time for some discussion and questions, but for those interested, there's some uh, recommended readings here. Um, the first three are by myself, in some cases, uh, uh, well, the last one is with Dr. Day. These are the more accessible ones for Indian readers. EPW, everyone should have access to New Oxford Companion to Economics. Many of you have seen it's prescribed as part of Delhi University syllabus. Um, I have written more recent articles on anti-cartel enforcement in India, but those are in international journals, which very few libraries, even Delhi University does not subscribe to. So it might be a bit difficult to get hold of. Um, for those who are more interested in the theory of optimal deterrence or the theories underlying uh, industrial organize, modern industrial organization, the best introduction, introductory textbook is this one by Luis Cabral, which is available oops, sorry, as a low cost Indian edition, actually an MIT press book which is very expensive, but Prentice Hall of India has brought out a low cost Indian edition uh, for a few hundred rupees, I think four or 500 rupees. Uh, it is the most non-technical. As I said, this body of uh, theory uses game theory systematically, but Cabral does most of it without too much game theory, mainly with numerical examples and lots of real world cases, of course, all from Europe and US. Um, my articles deal with a lot of Indian cases. When our joint current paper with Dr. Day comes out, it will be in, I think, a Routledge India public book edited by Kaushik Basu, it should be reasonably accessible in India. So uh, you can see it there. All right, so with that, uh, let me stop it, the presentation here and open the floor for any questions. So Rama, how do you want to do this? Uh, sir, I would urge the participants to raise hands or unmute themselves. Uh, 
we have allowed to them to unmute themselves. So uh, kindly uh, pose your questions directly to sir. We have ten minutes or so. Ask a question. Sorry. Uh, uh, can uh -huh. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I am Rekha Sharma. I just want to ask one question. Sure. Uh, that is just a curiosity. Since you have done such a detailed, uh, uh, you know, uh, survey of these cartels and uh, presented that, uh, it is which sector or which industries which uh, generally have uh, cartel in India, primarily? Ah, well, what we know is only the cartels that have been successfully uh, prosecuted by the Competition Commission. The most prominent case was the cement companies, uh, which were uh, uh, found in 2012 and hit with the biggest penalty imposed so far, all the major cement companies. Uh, that is still in appeal before the Supreme Court nine years later. Then, as I said, the film distributors, the pharma distributors, uh, lots of uh, smaller sectors like trucking and uh, uh, transport operators and so on. You can just look at the website of the Competition Commission. It's quite a, a good website. It's very transparent. You, you look under um, orders. Judgments are technically called orders in uh, Indian legal terminology. Look under orders and all their judge, uh, judgments are given there. The search facility is not very good, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Or you can read some of my articles. Uh, we discuss in great detail wh which sectors uh, were uh, very frequently in in involved in cartelization. I was just thinking uh, the penalty which the CCI imposes should also be related to the nature of the commodity that you are dealing with. So pharmaceuticals, uh, probably if it's a life-saving concept. Entertainment is something different. So if the purpose of the commodity which you are producing is different, probably the penalty should be according to uh, that as well. Ah, uh, well, from the law and economics perspective, no, the emotions have, or have no role to play. It's purely a cost benefit analysis. So it has to be dependent on profit. But the CCI has in a few cases found and said that it is shameful or shocking that firms are making profit based on uh, something so essential as pharmaceuticals. Oh yeah, the other sector or sectors are in government procurement, in particular supplies to the Indian railways. So uh, the railways have been very proactive in complaining about the cartel activities of many of their vendors. And uh, they have been found in several cases for different components, not the big things which we are familiar with, not, not the engines and bogies, but small, small components like brake blocks or uh, something called the latest case just a few months ago was something called brushless DC fans. I don't know what that is. DC I presume is direct current. So it's a small component of the electrical system of an electric locomotive. There's a cartel in, in that. Uh, there was a cartel found in uh, supplying uh, uh, flashlights, you know, torches. So different sectors, but no, in general, the law does not allow a distinction based on necessity or essential or luxury. It's a very hard-headed law. It, it's left to the judgment of the commission whether within that uh, band of zero to 10%, it wants to be harsher on uh, commodities that are more essential. Yes, any other? I saw one pop up saying, what is normal profit? A normal profit here is not the normal profit we uh, teach in first year BA micro. Uh, that, that is uh, the opportunity cost of capital. Normal, what I call normal profit here 
is because I didn't know how many people are familiar with, with the game theory that N would actually stand for the Nash equilibrium profit. That is in an oligopoly also firms would earn greater than normal profit. What we call normal profit in a perf in perfect competition, all firms earn no normal profit. In oligopoly, all firms earn more than normal profit. And that is the pi n. That is what would have been the profit if firms did not form the cartel. Only oligopolistic firms are going to form cartels. The firms that are close to perfect competition, there are too many of them. They would find it very hard to discuss with each other and agree with each other on what should be the cartel price or quantity. So uh, is there any provision where there's a conflict of uh, law interest? For example, uh, as you have told that the cement cartel case, the competition commission had come and uh, put in stringent actions. But, but, but again, when the realtor group within uh, the NCR region, in fact, there was a case like that also. So in oh, that, uh, the, in that one, the cement price hiking up was uh, also posed by these people as responsible for the escalation of prices uh, of the unsold uh, flats. They were giving like that. So when there is a, a negative externality spillover like this between uh, uh, sectors which are related, is there any uh, mechanism to resolve it? Well, there's no uh, conflict here. The, the realtors are the victims or they claim that they were the victims. And in principle, they could now approach the appellate tribunal for compensation. Yeah. Or if they passed on the higher cost of cement to the home buyers, then the home buyers can also claim compensation. But that part of the act is still untested as to who all may claim, how much they may claim, and so on. So there's no conflict of law here. If the uh, realtors were doing something wrong themselves, and many of them have in fact been found guilty of the abuse of dominance clause, DLF in particular has been hit with a huge fine, but that's for something else. That is for imposing unfair uh, terms and conditions on the contracts which they signed with the home buyers, one-sided conditions where if the DLF did not deliver the flat, there was a very minor penalty. If the home buyer could not pay the installments, there was a major penalty mm -hmm. in terms of uh, paying extra or giving up the allotment. Or the fact that the realtor retained the right to arbitrarily reallocate the flats. So you applied for one particular kind of flats and what you got allotted could be another one, the contract had no safeguard against that. So that's a different class of malpractice, which can be uh, prosecuted independently, either before the competition commission or the consumer courts have been quite proactive on this. That's a different class of laws or under contract law. So there is a range of um, options. Now you have this RERA, the Real Estate yeah. uh, Regulatory Real Authority Regulation has been Agency. passed in several states and an authority has been set up. Again, relatively recent and yet to be tested as to how effective it is. So when there is this NP, this is, uh, sorry, I'm asking another question. Uh, when there is this National Pharmaceutical Pricing Authority, hmm. the purview of the Pharmaceutical Pricing Authority is over monopolistic tendencies or the mono, all the all the competition policy, com, competition commission has got a say over the pharma companies? Ah, no, the, uh, the, they both have a say, but they have different roles and responsibilities. The NPPA fixes uh, ceiling prices on the so-called essential drugs. It is not concerned with the nature of competition prevailing in the pharma sector, whether there's a monopoly or whether it's competitively supplied, the firms cannot charge more than the specified ceiling price. Competition Commission, on the other hand, is charged with looking into the behavior of the industry in terms of those specified competition anti-competitive activities. So it's a different kind of remedy, you can say. 
I had to skip that slide where I was talking about difference between antitrust and regulation. Regulation involves things like price ceiling, or <coughs> where uh, something is regarded as um, essential, even if, uh, or when there is competition is not possible. That is, in some sectors, because of high fixed costs like airports, ports, power, telecom, you cannot have many many firms. At most, you will have two or three. In the case of airports, at most one in each city so far. So then you have to allow a monopolist. But then we have regulatory authorities which can specify the uh, airport's charges, conditions of service, what's called access. They have to give open access uh, to different airlines, to different uh, power distribution companies, uh, to, uh, and so and to different uh, telephone networks. Most of us have only one landline provided by our local landline supplier, MTNL in Delhi. But we can receive calls from any, from cell phone companies also. That means that because MTNL, like any regulated utility, has to give access to all suppliers. That's a condition of regulation. So, so also each of these, they cannot say we will carry calls only on our network. That is, Vodafone can call only Vodafone and Airtel can call only Airtel and Geo can only call Geo. They have to give access with a certain small charge, which has now been abolished, interconnection charge, so that people can call freely across networks. That is what TRAI has laid down. Okay, I think we are running out of time, Rama, no? Yeah, uh, Dr. Malik, you ask the last question, please, and then we'll wrap up. Sir, he, he has it. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. It is very comprehensive lecture. Just I want to ask, what is your view about the sir, Reliance Geo has entered into this telecommunication uh, sector and destroy other uh, so many companies by uh, this one particular name here, sir. He, he has given the free of cost uh, the six months of or one month, uh, one year offer, sir. He has extended again and again, sir. And other companies yes. file a case against the Reliance Geo, sir. Your view, sir, please. Well, it's a pending case. Uh, so subjudice, I, uh, the question that will arise, that uh, has arisen is whether Geo, at the time it was doing this, whether it comes under the definition of a dominant firm, because only a dominant firm is uh, prohibited from doing predatory pricing. <coughs> Geo is saying, it's, I was a new firm, it was my introductory offer. TRAI did not object, it kept giving me extension. And now after I became powerful, I stopped doing it. But meanwhile, the others have been virtually destroyed. But I will say one thing, competition law is meant to protect competition, not competitors. And competition always has losers. So people cannot complain that I am being thrown out of business unless they can show that some unfair means were used by the other firm. Because the very basis of a competitive marketplace is competition on the merits. You might say it's the law of the jungle, survival of the fittest. And so uh, firms that lose in that struggle cannot uh, say that there's been a violation of law unless they can bring it under one of those specific clauses of the law to show that some illegal tactics were being used. Simply losing in competition, it's like losing in a, in a sport. It's part of the game. As long as everyone's playing according to the rules of the game. Otherwise, the referee will give you a yellow card. <laughs> okay, I think uh, now okay. we've exceeded time. We probably you, have another session. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, sir, for your, uh, your uh, very comprehensive uh, 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 introduction to this uh, phase of industrial policy. And uh, I'm sure uh, many uh, of us would have questions. I myself has, uh, have some, but I'll uh, uh, engage with you with uh, on another uh, okay. and I'll be happy to answer questions from any of the participants. I, my email was on that last slide. Uh, if yeah. you didn't catch it, uh, uh, I'm sure uh, Rama can supply it to you. I'll be very happy to. You do that, uh, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.
So, dear participant, uh, uh, should we start the next session uh, straight away, or uh, uh, do you need some two three minutes to rest? I think the next speaker is also. Uh, uh, the speaker is already there. Already there. So. Uh, well, maybe a two, three minutes break would be appreciated. You know, we can grab at least a glass of water or yeah. quickly a washroom break. Two minutes, I think. Okay. That would be appreciated. Thank you. We will reassemble at 5.10. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>